This book was a kind of a spin-off from writing about nuclear weapons. I've written four books of nuclear history. I kind of ran out of nuclear history. My, my first one starts with the development of the first atomic bombs, but the most recent one is about well, it didn't include North Korea. It's not that recent, but it's close otherwise. But the whole dilemma of energy today struck me as something, as with the development of nuclear energy and nuclear weapons, that would benefit by going back to the beginning and looking for what might have been alternative pathways or alternative choices uh, in earlier times that, that might have made a difference with where we are now. What I found was, most dramatically of all, from my point of view, uh, remarkable regularities in the transitions from one major source of energy to another. Uh, let's see, I can actually show you this in a way. This is a hard graph to see from the back, I know, but let me just say this is the energy is life graph that was developed a few years ago that plots, let's see, this one does per capita GNP against lifespan. And if you can read the names of some of the countries way down here where lifespan is fairly short, they're also energy poor. They're also GNP poor. poor. Uh, there's a kind of a line at 70 years of life that seems to be what someone calls the egalitarian uh, energy supply line. It's somewhat less than we use in the United States. Uh, and many other developed countries are on the other side of that line. But it gives you an idea of just how important energy actually is. A very similar graph could be drawn if the uh, horizontal part were uh, were uh, electrical supply. So in a way, the GNP is a stand-in for that. Another and really central graph to what I was going to be writing about is this chart that was developed back in the 1970s by a group uh, in Vienna, the International Institute of, let's see here. Thank you, Applied Systems Analysis. Cesar Marchetti, Marchetti, the Italian physicist and his group, looked at fraction of world energy for various energy sources starting in 1850. And as you can see, found that wood was in sharp decline, oil, coal was rising and reached its peak around 1930, 1940. Uh, natural gas and nuclear came along later, oil. And then at the far right is an imaginary source called sulfus, which is some other new energy source that would have started around the year 2000. Uh, there is no such other energy source, really. But the point that they were hoping to make was simply that because it takes so long to transition from 1% to 50% of the world's energy supply, any new major source that came along around the turn of the millennium uh, isn't going to get very far, probably. Uh, and from the perspective of this particular projection, it looked to this group as if the major energy sources for at least the first half of our present century would be natural gas and nuclear power. Now, that didn't turn out to be quite true, and I'll show you another graph later. But I wanted you to see this because, in a way, this is the book. This is what I wrote about. If you were to compress the whole 400 pages of the book into one chart, this would be that chart. And then the other chart, which we're all familiar with, which is the rise in, in temperature over the last, what is it? 1860, over the last 150 years. Um, one era that really strikes me as strangely and eerily parallel to the present time was Elizabethan England. 
and Jacobi in England, they were facing a transition just the opposite in a way of what we've been facing or are facing. They were running out of wood, firewood. They were running out of firewood by, because as they cut down trees farther and farther away from London, it got more and more expensive to, to, to ship the firewood, uh, actually wagon the firewood to London. And pretty soon, by around eight, uh, 1690 or so, uh, firewood was almost too expensive for common people to afford. That meant they had to find something else that was cheaper or more energetic or some combination that would work for them. But their infrastructure wasn't set up for anything other than firewood. They didn't have chimneys in most of their houses. There was usually a raised stone platform. In this case, it's in a kitchen, and it's not in, not in England, but in what Germany. But it's the same basic idea. They built their fires. Either there was a hole in the ceiling that let the smoke out, or more typically, they let the smoke wander through the rooms and, and uh, blow out the window. Even when there were chimneys, they were very often not built to uh, reach above the eaves of a house. So there was no draw in the chimney. It was just, as luck might have it, the smoke would go out. That was fine, they felt, with wood. They liked the smell of wood. They thought the wood hardened the rafters of their homes. There was even a pretty common belief that wood smoke was good for your lungs, which was, of course, not the case, but they thought so. Uh, but when they had to switch, they, the, the other fuel that was available to them was coal. And coal was characteristically just absolutely wrong for their physical setup. You try to burn coal on a raised platform in your living room and imagine, the, and this was a particularly sulfurous kind of coal that came from uh, Newcastle, imagine the effect of trying to roast your good English beef on a coal fire. It was a disaster. And then their, their preachers compounded the problem by concluding that since coal is found in layers underground and is black and dirty and when you burn it smells of sulfur, that it was literally the devil's excrement, uh, which doesn't encourage you to carry it into your house either. But they really, they really had no other option. And in this case, it was a cultural change that encouraged them to make the transition with, with less fear and concern than they would otherwise have had. Elizabeth I died around 1600, and uh, James VI of Scotland became King of England, James I. He came to London with a very different set of, of uh, assumptions about energy supply. <laughs> Scotland never had as dense a forest as England's, and they had cut down most of their wood 100 years earlier. They also had a somewhat better quality coal that they could burn. <laughs> So the, the new king of England burned coal, and he continued to burn coal in his castles in England as well as he had in Scotland. Uh, when the king began burning coal, then it suddenly became socially acceptable to burn coal. Uh, the king did it, then it was, it was, it was good to do. Uh, the only drawback was they still had to retrofit their houses all over England with chimneys at considerable, of course, expense. This was reflected hundreds of years later when the English, in, 18, in 1952, had a famous mass killing of, by, by a winter of fog and coal smoke in London, some 3,000 excess deaths in the months of January and February in 1952, and realized uh, after due study that they had to find some other source of energy to burn in their homes. And they switched to, first of all, coal gas, uh, which is made by roasting coal in an enclosed environment and using the fumes, which are basically gaseous, I guess, what is it, methane or something. Uh, and, and burning that instead of coal. And then about 10 years later, they discovered natural gas in great quantities around, around the island and switched over to that. But again, because natural gas burns, uh, has much more energy by volume than, than coal gas, they had to retrofit all their furnaces and all their stoves with new equipment in order to burn the new product. So uh, 
uh, the message of the Marchetti graph that I showed you earlier of the decline and rise of various energy sources and the message that I think is fundamental for our concerns today is that it takes about 100 years or historically has taken about 100 years to move from 1% fraction of the world energy supply of one source of energy to another, uh, to, to move to 50% of the world's energy supply. Dominant, in other words, as much as any type of energy ever is. We still face that now. In fact, the Marchetti study indicated that, that the uh, transition, the slow transition is fairly independent of the things you would think would affect it, like changes in fuel prices, wars, all, all these transformations that might, we might imagine would, would quickly uh, allow us to make the transition to another source. That didn't seem to show up on their studies. Well, once you start digging for coal, the first kind you get is the kind that's close to the surface. And that, that's OK until you've used that up. The English pretty quickly started digging deeper. Their deepest coal mines in these, these, these two centuries were as much as 800 feet below ground. Uh, once you get below farther down, you intersect the water table. And at that point, if you don't have a way to pump out the water, uh, your mine floods and you can't continue to, to dig out the coal. So they had a serious problem. This is an image of a typical flooded English mine. Uh, they had a problem with having to shut down coal mines that, that were productive in any, every other way because they were full of water. And their first solution was simply to uh, use horses to attach to things called whims, whimsies. They had been used to for merry-go-rounds in parks, and this was a variation on that. But horses really couldn't move water that many hundreds of feet in a very efficient way. And that, of course, added pressure to inventors and capitalists of various kinds to find a more efficient way to do that, which, which led through an interesting series of odds and ends that I found in the book that includes such things as the French invention of the pressure cooker. <laughs> which was one of the lab tools that was used to develop the, the steam engine. And it was the steam engine that then made it possible. This is an early atmospheric engine that uses steam to uh, make a vacuum in the cylinder, which then, as you can see, where the pump is, let's see, I think I have a, yeah, this is the huge pump that pumps the coal mine, and it's attached here to an open cylinder piston. And that's because once you make a vacuum down here in the cylinder, atmospheric pressure pushes the, this down and raises the beam and pumps the water. That, was, that worked well, although it was less than 1% efficient. Another problem with new technologies, they often just barely work at all. Mr. Uh, Musk admitted to his stockholders at a meeting in 2016 that the first Tesla, the little sports car, just barely ran, which, which was true. <laughs> its batteries consisted of some several thousand laptop batteries all pack, packed together in a unit and cooled and so forth. Uh, so even though this new common type engine was the size of a house, as you can see, uh, and was very inefficient. Nevertheless, it would move water 32 feet. That was the equivalent of atmospheric pressure on, on the cylinder. Not the world's best solution, but, but good enough for a start. These coal mines were typically up in the hills close to a source of water for floating, barging the coal to London. This was a typical rig for moving coal down to the river or to the shore. The horse is there to pull the empty cart back up the hill. Gravity controls, and you can see the big brake that, uh, this is the big brake that was used to control the cart going down the hill. The next, when James Watt developed a more efficient steam engine, one that didn't rely on atmospheric pressure, but used steam to move the piston in both directions. Uh, 
it was possible then to make smaller steam engines, which then could be mounted on wheels. Their first use was to move that coal down to the river from farther inland away from the river, possibly over several hills. Uh, but someone fairly quickly realized that if you could move carts of coal with this steam engine, you could move people. And we had the beginning of railroads in England, one design and system piggybacking on the next. But railroads were a tough sell. People, people were quite convinced that if, and I did find original documentation for this statement, people were convinced that if you went more than faster than a horse could run, you might not be able to breathe and you might die. They couldn't see blurred, the, the, the landscape passing them because they hadn't learned to pan their heads with the motion of the, of the train. So it took some learning just to be able to ride on a train. And, and of course, it took the whole question of what kind of engines they were going to use. For a while, they were putting stationary engines at the tops of hills using two or three mile long cables to pull the train up to the hill and let it roll down and hook it up to the next cable to the next stationary steam engine. There was a big contest in England about which, which way they'd go, whether they'd use stationary engines and pull them around or whether they'd put the engine on the train. Uh, so it took a while again before the technology turned into something as elegant as this Stevenson's rocket, this wonderful engine that won the contest about whether they were going to go with uh, stationary engines or, or engines mounted on the train itself. That's a reproduction that was built some years back. We didn't really need railroads because we didn't have any access to the wilderness yet. So in the United States, except along the East Coast, more typically steam engines went on steamboats. And they used, of course, our river system as a method, as a way of getting around and, and exploring and so forth. John James Audubon in 1840 went exploring up into the upper Midwest and the upper Far West uh, by taking a steamboat up the Missouri River, the Mississippi and then the Missouri. Got rather far up and studied uh, what he called viviparous quadrupeds, meaning mammals, basically, uh, to add to his work previously done about the birds. The steam engines were, were, were not yet very safe. The, the technology to make a piece of iron that would hang together and be the boiler of a steam engine took quite a while to develop. Uh, and it really wasn't thoroughly in place until the development of welding in the early 20th century. So as you've probably heard, steamboats had a way of blowing up quite often. The side effect of all this technology, the bad side of all this technology, was air pollution. Air pollution at a level that I think we've hardly, most of us who are, most of you who are under 60 probably have never seen. But there's a typical example of smoke in 19th century England, and it wasn't the only place. This is uh, Beijing in 2016. We think about how polluted China's cities have become from burning coal, but ours were too. It's as if you have to get your energy first, and then you look back and say, now let's clean up the mess. So something like that, it's not because China is somehow defective in this regard. They've just been developing to the point where they're now preparing to try and deal with their air pollution. So let's move to light, the other, another theme of this book. Uh, until really the middle of the 19th century, most lighting was candlelight, if you could imagine. I mean, most of the, the, the peasant peoples of the world just went to bed when it got dark and stayed in bed until the sun came up. If there was any lighting, as you can see in this, this illustration or in the famous story of Abraham Lincoln reading by the fire, it was firelight or candles or various kinds of oil, typically a vegetable oil. Or rushlight, which I think we've all forgotten about, but if you go out and gather those big 
big uh, reeds that grow along streams all over the world and peel down the hard exterior coating, leaving one little strip to hold the pith together and then let the pith dry out, it has a natural uh, capillary system built into it and it can then be soaked in any kind of available grease like bacon grease or whatever and allowed to coalesce and cool and then you can burn it for lighting. It was the cheapest because the reeds were free. Uh, it was a job to strip out all these pieces of pith but if you could get about 1,600 of these things all worked up, you had enough lighting to last most of the winter or all the winter. And that's a typical unit for, for uh, whoops, sorry, wrong button. <laughs> that's a typical unit. There's the reed. You light this end, move it up as it burns down, and that's your light for the evening. It was, of course, the whale oil is the one we've all heard about as the standard lighting, but it actually wasn't. It was, it was one source of lighting in the form of lamp oil uh, for people who could afford it, but it was always pretty expensive oil, twice or more as expensive as some of the other kinds I'll show you. Uh, The best of it, spermaceti, which was found in the big head case of the whale, could be used to make a lovely clear oil that burned with almost no odor and a fairly bright light. Or, since spermaceti is actually a kind of wax, it could be used to make wonderful candles, but they were really the exclusive property of the wealthier part of the population. And the more common source of light was something called burning fluid, which was made with Turpentine drawn from the vast pine forests of the southeastern United States, uh, taken from the tree in a process that is sort of an enlarged version of maple sap, although this was not sap, this was kind of the tree's liquid bandage that was drained in these great cuts that they made and down into a kind of a natural pocket that was carved into the tree. It only took about three years to destroy the tree using this system. And then the wood would be cut and used for, for firewood, I suppose, than any other use. That was great. And it really, it was much cheaper burning fluid, which was made by mixing alcohol, grain alcohol with the turpentine and a little bit of menthol to make the smell better. Uh, that was great until the beginning of the Civil War when the northern blockade of southern ports basically ended the, the trade in, in uh, turpentine. The South no longer could ship it north and we didn't buy it anymore. The whaling industry had been declining. We had been knocking off about 10,000 whales a year during the prime part of the, the whaling years. And that in turn meant that the whales were chased farther and farther away. And again, as with firewood in Elizabethan England, <laughs> the farther away the whales were, the more expensive it was to hunt them down. Voyages that had typically taken two years at the beginning of the whaling era uh, started taking up to six years or more, and that meant much more expense for the owners of the ship, paying the men and all the rest. So, so although the oil industry likes to say that it was the discovery of petroleum in Pennsylvania in 1859 that saved the whales, it actually was not. The whales were pretty much already gone by then. I think what, what, what the f discovery of petroleum did was, was save the lighting industry because until the invention of the automobile at the turn of the 20th century, the only use for petroleum, there were two uses. One was for lighting in the form of kerosene, and the other was for lubrication of machinery. And the byproducts of the, the uh, distillation of early petroleum, such as gasoline, were just waste products. Gasoline was dumped out on the ground to evaporate, or it was thrown into the rivers at night, like a lot of other waste products that were produced in those days, like slaughterhouse waste and they really had no use for it. So when, and there's a typical mess of an oil field in Pennsylvania around that time, 
So when Edison's first lamp came in, and this lamp had about a 20 watt, what we would call 20 watts of light, uh, the oil industry was worried. All of a sudden, the, one of the major uses for petroleum, for lighting in the form of kerosene, uh, looked like it might go out. Actually, of course, people continued to burn kerosene wherever there was not electricity available. And Edison's direct current electricity program was only local. You couldn't send direct current very far. Someone once said that if you tried to send electricity from uh, Wall Street up to 59th Street in New York, you would need a, a copper wire the size of a man's leg. The uh, direct current doesn't ship very well under the circumstances of those times. <clears throat> and he stoutly resisted the introduction of alternating current, which could easily be, of course, transformed into higher voltage, lower amperage, and shipped wherever you wanted it. That was the great battle between Edison and Westinghouse toward the end of the 19th century. But the petroleum industry really was quite in trouble until the automobile came along. And even the automobile, there was an interesting time of transition between uh, gasoline-powered machines like Henry Ford's early cars or electrics, which had the advantage that you didn't have to crank them, which women had trouble with. The crank was so hard to turn, particularly when it was cold weather. Uh, and steamers, which was the other kind of car. Very nice, efficient little cars, but at first they had the problem that if you turned it off and went in and did some business and came back out, you'd have to wait 15 or 20 minutes to build up a head of steam. Something like the problem with battery-powered cars today. The solution for the Stanley Steamer Company, at least, the one that made most of the steamers during that era, and the, the Stanley Steamer was the most popular automobile in terms of numbers of cars sold in 1900, much more so than, than Ford's early models. Uh, Stanley Steamer Company put in a pilot light, basically. They kept the water hot so that when you came out, you might not have to wait more than five minutes. But they solved at least that part of the problem. But the real disaster for the steamer came in 1914. Uh, they relied on the fact that rural areas kept troughs around on the roadside for horses to drink water from. But in 1914, there was an outbreak of hoof and mouth disease, which is transmitted by, among other things, access to water that another animal with the disease has, has drunk from. And New England got rid of all the water troughs. And suddenly the steamer was limited to the cities where it could get water. So that's the kind of accidental change that you don't anticipate that can change things for you as well. The uh, first Model T, not this car, but the later Model T, actually had a flex fuel switch next to the steering wheel. You could turn the carburation to handle alcohol, grain alcohol. Ford was a champion of uh, farming and wanted to help farmers, and he figured they could make alcohol from their grains and sell it and be prosperous with the automobile spread. So. He had a flex fuel switch that allowed you to burn gasoline or alcohol. Uh, that was the time, however, when Americans were moving to cities by the millions. And farmers were as prosperous as they ever were in their history. They had no interest particularly in selling their, in turning their corn into alcohol when they could use it to feed cattle, which they could sell to the city to feed the people. So there really was not an adequate supply of alcohol available to meet this need. And when Mr. Kettering of uh, General Motors went to work on solving the problem of gasoline being low octane and, and causing knocking in the early low compression engines and cars, he used a mixture of gasoline and alcohol in some of his testing that allowed the automobile to have a higher octane. Alcohol has an octane rating of 105. So if you mix some with gasoline, you raise the rating. Uh, but he was in competition. General Motors was in competition with Ford. And General Motors' answer to the competition was to build higher compression engines and larger automobiles to meet the new desire for a, an automobile that showed your prosperity.
uh, conspicuous consumption. To do that, he needed to find a way to increase the effective octane rating of gasoline. And the solution he found, sadly, was tetraethyl lead. And lead was the material that then was, was spread over America from the exhausts of automobiles until the 1970s, when the introduction of the, the uh, uh, catalytic, converter. catalytic converter, thank you, uh, meant that they had to get the lead out of the gasoline or the converter would be poisoned by it, it wouldn't work. So it wasn't because children were having their IQs reduced by lead poisoning all over America, it was, it was fixing the engine. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead because we're near the end of the time and I want to get to talking about today. But you'll find a lot of other stories in the book that I think will fascinate you, such as the big inch and the little big inch pipelines that became the first way that natural gas was moved across the United States and had to do with German submarines in World War II. <coughs> Here is the... Uh, 1952 disaster in, in London that I talked about. This was the graph that really convinced everybody that it was indeed the smoke that was causing the deaths, the way they lined up on this comparative chart. There's London in 1952 to get a, get a sense again of just how polluted things were in those times. But here also is the George Washington Bridge in New York in 1973. So it's taken a while to make that transition away. The first really new source of energy in the 20th century was, was of course, nuclear power. These men are building the first nuclear reactor in the University of Chicago in the winter of 1942. Stacks of graphite bricks plugged with uranium slugs. Oops, here we go again. That's a slug of uranium right there that's going to be dropped into a hole in these bricks. That was a very small reactor. It was not even shielded because it produced so little bit of energy, about enough to light a light bulb. But it started a whole new world of technology, the first source of energy, major source of energy that was not indirectly or indirectly derived from sunlight. And one that sadly also came to, to public view carrying the trail of two cities destroyed by firebombing with, with atomic bombs, something that I think has plagued it ever since. That was the day they actually started up the reactor, which is on the right. Bikini test. I don't know if you've ever seen this photograph, but there's a battleship here along the wall somewhere. So I think that's it. To give you a sense of the scale of that image, Shipping Port was the first commercial power reactor built in the United States. Hyman Rickover and his crew built it uh, to demonstrate, basically, that nuclear power could generate electricity in an efficient way. I interviewed the president of the Duquesne Light Company, which was the company that bought this reactor from the government <clears throat> back in the uh, 70s. He said, and it's ironic, he said, when we talked to the city council in Pittsburgh, which this reactor serves, uh, they told us that they wanted a new green technology like nuclear power uh, to cut down on the air pollution in their city, to reduce the amount of cold smoke that was choking everybody in Pittsburgh, and that this nuclear power machine looked like it would be the, just the, the ticket. And of course, it, it was to a degree. They were doing many things to reduce their air pollution in Pittsburgh at that point. But nuclear power was one of the things they did. Early wind machines, rather, rather quaint and amazing. Oops, sorry, here we go. That's a man mowing the lawn right there to give you a sense of the scale. This, this one was built privately by a wealthy man in, I think, Ohio. Yeah. He had a basement full of lead acid batteries to store the energy that the windmill made, and he used it to light his house and run his machinery. This was built in Scotland uh, by a Scottish uh, physicist 
and in this manifestation was used to run as backup for what was then called a, a lunatic asylum, operated for some 27 years very successfully to generate electricity with wind. You, I, pres I offer this just to suggest the industrial scale of modern, modern wind turbine technology. It's really quite extraordinary. Uh, this is a, uh, an illustration of how the question that's perennially asked about nuclear power, which is, but what about the waste? This is the development of the, one of the first permanent waste disposal sites, although it is a reversible site. Uh, on an island off the coast of uh, Finland, this is how they prepare the slugs of fuel, uh, encasing them in various materials. And then down about a kilometer or two below ground in a bedrock of solid granite, they're laid out in these tunnels and then the whole thing sealed up. I don't think that that waste is going to find the surface again anytime soon. Then we come back to this graph that I talked about at first, the one that suggests that what we're dealing with today is the largest energy transition of all time, and one that, that the, these projections from the early 1980s suggest will be uh, a movement toward world energy supplied mainly by natural gas and nuclear power. But in 2007, uh, a political scientist decided to take another look at the numbers. And he found to his shock, and I suppose to Mr. Marchetti's shock as well, that things had changed as a result of the Arab oil embargo that what had been regular patterns of up and down in terms of energy use had all sort of frozen in place at wherever they were then. And I don't think change, things have changed much since this 2007 projection. That is to say, nuclear, which was on a very steep, almost too steep, increase of, of its fractional share of world energy back in the uh, second half of the 20th century, not only leveled off, but is actually beginning to show a decline, largely because of the decline in the United States and the deliberate phasing out of some, in some countries in Europe. Uh, sources that were clearly in dec decline leveled off. Wood is actually increasing in use these days because it's a, a source of energy that is understood to not add ultimately to CO2 since it's renewable, and so forth. So it turns out we're in a worse place than we thought we were going to be, in the sense that it's not at all clear how we're going to get past what is today's dilemma. And today's, today's dilemma is that we not only have to deal with decarbonizing the entire world energy supply, something on a scale that we've never done before. All these energy transitions were regional or even within one country. And now we're facing an energy transition because of global warming, primarily, that, that encompasses the entire world. Energy transition effects are now world scale, and that is a much bigger challenge, particularly given our political structure in the world, particularly given the new nationalism that we're dealing with these days. Uh, and at the same time, much of what we used to call the third world is rapidly industrializing, increasing its per capita income, improving the education of people, reducing their population of, of offspring, and are clamoring for the kind of levels of energy availability that we all take for granted. So we've got these two huge problems to solve at the same time. And I don't know the answer. I just attended a fascinating seminar at the Hoover Institution that George Schultz uh, chaired that came up with a lot of interesting discussion, particularly about nuclear power and where it might go, if it goes anywhere. Uh, 
there is a major movement toward building more nuclear power reactors in Asia in particular, uh, primarily in the case of China for dealing with pollution, air pollution, those cities that we looked at that looked like London in, in 1900. Uh, and and the, the Chinese, of course, aren't helping by selling their coal to other countries now, since they're, in many cases, not burning it themselves. But to make these things both happen at once is an almost superhuman challenge. And it's not going to be helped by people saying, oh, we can do it all with renewables, or nuclear is a pariah, it's the it's the devil's excrement of the 21st century, uh, and so on. I mean, obviously, I think part of the answer, besides new developments in technology, has to be that we use everything we've got that isn't carbon generating. And that means all the renewables. That means nuclear in a major way, and whatever else we can think of along the way. Uh, that doesn't sit well with a lot of us because we've come up, uh, again, that natural resistance that I talked about that every energy transition has, has demonstrated. Uh, I don't know if I said this, but when the first electric lights came in, a lot of people complained that they were too bright. They didn't want them around. They wanted their nice gas lamps on the wall. That sort of thing uh, interferes and slows and delays the transition till it becomes that 100 years that has traditionally been. I don't think we have 100 years. I think we're going to have to move somehow, move faster than that. It's an immense challenge. I don't have the answer. Uh, I'm optimistic about it. I was impressed that the group I was with today, some real leaders in these fields, were optimistic about it. But it, it is a challenge, and I think most of all for all of us, it asks us to take another look at all these things and try to look at them as rationally as possible and see what makes sense. Thank you. Richard, thank, thanks very much for that fascinating but somewhat sobering retrospective. I do think it actually frames the current challenges before us quite well. And I will point out, we actually have some people in the audience, so I think we're involved in putting together the all the, all the above uh, strategy. Uh, so as long as that's called the all above uh, strategy and not the Obama strategy, I think it may be the way, uh, the way forward these days. Uh, so we have a few minutes for questions here. Richard is also doing a book signing at the bookstore today at 6 o'clock. 6 o'clock? Oh, it's going to be right outside, even easier for all you guys, so you can get uh, to ask more questions at that point and uh, get a book signed. Uh, yeah. So uh, usually we start with uh, student questions. Are there any student questions? So there are some way in the back there. Um, as battery storage technology continues to increase, how do you see that playing into maybe more development of the renewables in terms of like solar and wind and less of nuclear and other carbon free sources? You know, it would be nice to think there would be an instant breakthrough with new batteries, but the uh, electric cars of the turn of the 20th century got about 30 miles on their batteries. Uh, we're not much better than that now, 118 years later. Uh, whether or not something can really be that transformative, I seriously doubt. And that's why I think, again, I, you know, I always ask people the question when they say without nuclear, why not nuclear? What is it about nuclear that seems so undesirable that we don't want to include a major source of baseload energy in our, in our mix? Is it because you don't think there's a place to put the waste? Because I think I demonstrated there are already several places to put the waste. What is it about nuclear that scares people so? Is it the radiation? Yeah. Newer ways, like there are, there are newer methods of like nuclear technology being developed that does I'm not. I'm sorry, I can't use. hear you. Speak up. So there are like newer like technologies for nuclear that are being developed that don't actually create waste. Yeah. Then how come we aren't implementing it when we can have the opportunity to? And we there's no technology that doesn't create waste. Uh, the immense amount of materials that have to be used to make major solar fields or wind farms, for example, 
<clears throat> produce an enormous amount of waste at the other end of the life cycle of those, those big machines and have to be dealt with. And it isn't particularly clean waste, it's pretty toxic waste as well. So there's just not an energy source that isn't, among other things, a source of waste. We get so much waste from coal burning, which, by the way, is the main source of radioactivity released into the environment, because coal is from the Earth's crust and has uranium in it uh, and other radioactive elements. Uh, we get so much waste from coal waste that, for example, the part that goes up the stack, that we really don't collect it and put it away somewhere. Let's do one more student in the back and then up here. Uh, so it seems like uh, in the past, technology has been, uh, has had both unexpected uses and unexpected consequences. I'm curious as to what you think, um, like policy or lack of regulation of these technologies has allowed for them to be adopted um, and used more widely versus also this lack of regulation or policy perhaps also allowing for consequences like um, uh, maybe like nuclear meltdowns or so, like polluting a whole city and like how do you see it playing a role in like what we end up using for the future? I wasn't entirely clear about what you asked, but I take it to be. I take it to get a student to be a micro. Uh, well, Could you repeat the question? If you got the, the question was on how to manage the externalities, so the good and the bad yeah. of energy sources, yeah. like waste disposal and air pollution and so on at the same time. So I think the intent of the question is. How do you manage that whole process? You could think of people, entrepreneurs and businesses doing new energy sources, but then if there's nobody, <laughs> what, give me this? Uh, there's nobody there watching the negative yeah. side effects. How do, you, how do you think about managing that? Well, of course, yeah. of course what, what that then becomes is a political issue. And we've seen plenty of that in this country over the years, and even especially today. With, with President Trump's move to try to bring coal back into the mix, which, by the way, is, is fruitless. There were 638 coal plants shut down in the last three years in the United States. Coal is a technology that really is in decline, whatever that graph proposed. So I think in that case, but, but you know, with all new technologies, especially today, more perhaps than 200 years ago, we quickly surround them, as we did the nuclear weapons business, with a whole network of laws and traditions and, and uh, treaties and so forth to, to kind of cage them and try to bring them under some sort of social control. And uh, we've done that with all the energy sources that we use, to greater or lesser benefit, depending, I guess, on who's, who's writing the laws and voting for the laws. But it's out there. That's why I'm basically optimistic about, despite the challenge, that we'll figure out a way to muddle through it as we have in the past. Human beings are really very creative people and, and, and don't propose to die out as a species, I'm sure, anytime soon. Uh, so I think despite the resistance that is a constant in all of these energy transitions, uh, we'll find our way through. But unlike in the past, uh, there is a limit. There's a timeline now to, I, I, I sk skipped a slide that I often show just to make my point about global warming. These are two guys down below where everyone now lives saying, are you going up to the top? And the other guy says, I don't know, it may be a little too warm today. In, in a town in northern Iran in 2015, the heat index one day in August, meaning temperature and humidity combined, was the equivalent of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. I went to my cookbook to figure out what that meant and found that that's the temperature of a roasted chicken. Uh, that's the kind of risks we're talking about. So it's not so simple as we can muddle along. We're going to have to be a little smarter than that this time around. Right here, and then up in the back, and then over there. Right. There is a uh, there is a technology um, that's being tested right now, and it's uh, hot dry rock heat exchange. If when you go between six and twelve kilometers down into the earth, they have any technologies you can do that. 
with a closed loop heat exchange um, and then put an inert substance with water in this case and then bring that back to the surface then you have um, you have that base load of energy the equivalent uh, to, to about a 250 megawatt power plant um, a nuclear power plant uh, or uh, or wind or solar but with a much smaller footprint about five acres versus uh, 1,200 acres for solar, 2,000 acres for wind, and there's and then when you're talking about um, bless you, when you're talking about the, um, the, uh, the 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 waste, the only waste is is, is essentially water, and yeah. there's no CO2 output either. And then that that way you can utilize the earth, the natural heat, yeah, the natural heat. This is the kind of development that, I, whether it can be scaled up to the scale that, of energy requirements this world has, I don't know. But I remember years ago visiting a friends in Sweden who had a rubber hose line running down to a bladder that they had put in the swamp below their house. And even though it was winter in Sweden and very cold, they were using heat exchanger to warm their house that way. Yeah, exactly. Right. So these are the kinds of innovations that we need to be working on. But again, it usually takes a long time to make these things happen. And there, of course, would be waste. There would be the waste of all the materials of the piping and so forth that would be used to circulate those, that water. Yeah. I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on uh, the Georgia nuclear project that cost you know, ratepayers billions of dollars and will never really be brought to fruition, not, not as a plug against nuclear, but just as how do you move forward when you have a project that was so detrimental in the economic aspect? You know, why would anyone want to try that again? Well, the truth before? is, as we were discussing earlier at Hoover, <clears throat> nuclear power is clearly on the decline in the United States. Partly, I think that's just simply uh, populist resistance to this form of energy because of its affiliation with nuclear weapons and, and with radiation. But it's also because we've been building one-off reactors uh, of very large scale that take a great deal of money, sending them through a long regulatory process for approval. We've simply basically priced nuclear power out. And the example that you're using of the reactor in, in the South uh, was a pretty good example of cost overruns and poor design and bad management and the whole toxic mix. That's fine, and I'm sure we can get along without nuclear power in the United States, although our energy will cost us more, I presume. But that's not going to solve the problem for Africa and Asia. They need enormous amounts of energy if they want to live at the, up above the 70 years of lifeline on that early graph I showed you. And the only place that they can really see to get it is nuclear, because then they can also clean up their air pollution at the same time. So one of the solutions we discussed earlier today was, in a sense, a reboot for nuclear, to start over, let the existing large scale and, and not very efficient and overly expensive reactors live out their lives. But go to work as many companies are now on small reactors that would be a lot friendlier, a lot safer, uh, and a lot less expensive to build. So there are answers, but they're really just now kind of getting a good look, unfortunately. I think we have time for three more, so we're going to go here. On the aisle here, and we'll go on the right hand side. thank you for the talk. It's very informative. Um, uh, Judging by your experience of kind of seeing the history of energy, I'm curious to know when um, you saw a transition from uh, humanity seeing as the earth and energy as abundant and endless, and transitioning to the point of, oh, wait a minute, it's finite, what should we do about it? Was there a key, key moment? Was there a key person? Well, there are two answers to that question. Each of these energy sources reached a point where people began to realize that it was no longer available at a reasonable price. That's when the pressure was on to find some other source. So on a small scale, that went on. But the transition that I think you're really talking about came about after the Second World War, 
And it's a curious story. We tend to think of the environmental movement as a benevolent movement, and by and large it is. But its origins were pretty shady, actually. Uh, there was a time in the 1960s when there was a great flush of discussion throughout the country and the world about overpopulation. There's still some of that hanging around, but mostly it's been uh, quieted by reality, basically. There was a sort of Malthusian assumption that the vastly increasing numbers of people in India and China would continue to increase geometrically, and that basically all the people of India and China were likely to starve. So in Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, among others, he proposes that we should basically write off those countries and not help them, not send them medicine, not send them food, let them starve, let them decrease their surplus population, as Scrooge would have it, and, and then we could somehow have a smaller, safer, healthier world. What he missed was, and he still has the same argument all these years later, uh, what he missed was the agricultural revolution on the one hand, Norman Borlaug and the people like him who found ways to grow more grain on a given space of land by improving the, the quality of the crops. Uh, and at the same time, the demographic transition that takes place in societies when people reach a point where, where they have at least most of their children surviving to adulthood. The main reason, evidently, that people used to have 10 or 12 children was that often only one or two would make it to adulthood because of epidemic diseases. As those diseases came under control, more children survived, and therefore they didn't need to have so many. And that population transition, the demographic transition, took, was taking place even at the time of the population bomb, but it hadn't really caught completely the, the, everyone's eye yet. But that's what happened, and, and now we're projecting a maximum world population of 10 billion. I mean, the population explosion people were talking about 40 or 50 or 70 billion human beings on Earth, and I don't know, we might well starve under those conditions. But 10 billion by the year 2100, at which point the UN projects that we will have leveled off and we, won't, we will be basically steady state. We won't be increasing in world population. It'll, as many will die as are born, basically. So that transition came about and turned everything around and made for a very different and I think much more hopeful future than we would have had, given the way people thought about it. Well, the answer to the population explosion theory uh, from the nuclear power side, and this was the time when commercial nuclear power was just developing in the United States, but people like Alvin Weinberg at uh, Oak Ridge Laboratory, who was a great uh, champion of nuclear power, saw nuclear power as the answer to the population problem. A new source of energy, potentially boundless, all the ideas that you have at the outset of a new source of energy that could counter the, the weight of the increasing population. He thought the world would not get beyond 20 billion, so he was even caught up in this whole theory. But he saw nuclear power, so there was a real battle between these two points of view. The people who started the environmental movement, uh, Browder at the Sierra Club, uh, Amory Lovins notably as well, were very much caught up in the population bomb belief. And they saw nuclear power as a way of basically stretching out the suffering, stretching out the disaster, rather than confronting it up front and dealing with it. So the origin of the anti-nuclear movement really wasn't because nuclear is dirty, because it's not, and it wasn't because of Three Mile Island, which didn't kill anybody and really didn't pollute anything except the plant itself. It was this argument back and forth about what are we going to do about this endless reproduction that's going on with the species who in books were often compared to worms or maggots or you know, horrible images. It will surprise you if you look at that early literature. And I quote it in the book. So that's roughly the answer to that question. I go over this in the book if you want to review it. I want to inject another access onto your graph, which has to do with efficiency. Yeah. Your basic graph is GNP yeah. versus life expectancy. Right. 
But you'll discover on that GNP graph, there are countries that are very different in their energy intensity and might have similar life expectancy. And so the issue of the, the efficiency of the use of energy, no matter what its source, yeah. is an enormous technological place that's going to be an important money going forward. And for your enthusiasm for the nuclear technologies, Fukushima Daiichi is a good example of a very modern, technologically competent country that has suffered a tremendous yeah. injury to their economy and land use from that technology. And I think to be very glib and say, oh, there's no danger in this and it's wonderful stuff, is ignoring some real physical things that have happened. Sure. And, and of course, Fukushima was a was an accident that caused enormous suffering in Japan. Whether that suffering was the cause of the reactor and the materials that were released, or whether it was because of anti-nuclear fears on the part of the Japanese is an interesting question. But I, I take your point, and I give you that point, and I would just say on top of that, efficiency is really something I left out of this book, and I should have included it. It belongs here. It's one part of the problems. I remember Amory Levins talking about uh, what did he call them, megawatts, and how efficiency can replace production of energy, and he's absolutely right. How far that can go, how much of that we can do. Again, it requires to do it at the scale, at least, that Amory used to talk about, it involves a huge change in infrastructure. I mean, he saw all the houses of America as being, re being rebuilt with uh, passive solar design, and that would be great, except that hasn't happened, and it would be a major task indeed to make it happen. So I, I again say, I think, and I left out, I really did leave out of this book, unfortunately. I, wasn't, I was thinking so much in terms of energy sources, that I forgot about this other energy source, which is no energy, if you will. It should be there, but it's not. One last question up here. Um, given your view of how humans have behaved and changed behavior based on hundreds of years of their experience with energy. Um, what, what, what would you put your money on? Or what do you think the best bet is in terms of what the human population looks like 100 years from now? Is it, <laughs> is it that? And what are the events that will have happened or not have happened in order to have gotten us to that point? Well, rather than... <clears throat> going all science fiction myself, <laughs> let me just talk about uh, the Marchetti work again. It seems pretty clear that regardless of the present freeze in sources, if we are going to be serious about decarbonizing the energy supply, we're going to be moving toward renewables, nuclear everywhere maybe but the United States and Europe, uh, and efficiencies of various kinds. So I don't know that we will look that different from where we are now, except the one deep trend, I think, through all of this has been the move toward electrification. Electricity is not a source of energy, of course. It's a transfer agent, but it's such a wonderfully efficient transfer agent. Once you get that in place in terms of both transportation and, and uh, housing and industry and so forth, uh, then how you produce the electricity can be a problem that's solvable without using something like coal. You can use whatever you got, and whatever works best wherever you're, you're producing it. I think, I think we're, you know, France is an interesting model. Forget the fact that they chose to go almost exclusively nuclear, but however they got their energy, uh, they're almost all electric now, and, except for their cars, and that's no doubt coming. The reason they are, of course, is that they make a lot of cheap electricity, and so everybody is encouraged to, to run their homes on electricity, to heat their food on electricity, and eventually to drive their cars on electricity. I think that's what we'll see, and it'll be a much cleaner world, as, as is France. France reduced its air pollution by a factor of five by, by going with the non-polluting source of energy. Well, Richard, thanks. Uh, Thank you all. I'll sign books.